Okay, first of all, these Buddha statues over here, these are very important to me. It's one of the places wherever, whenever I go to India, I would always like to go to Sarnath and the, Nash and the museum there. Because I did hear the original of this statue is in that museum, and next to Sarnath, outside of Benares. And the first time I went there, I was looking for it, see where I could find it. And there was no people to guide you where to go. Eventually I did turn a corner of the museum and I saw it at the end of the corridor. And honestly, I burst out crying. I was a monk at the time, but it really had so much of an impact on me. I was so inspired that I couldn't help myself. And the next time that occurred, I led a pilgrimage to India, the same thing happened. Although this time, I was prepared. I had lots of tissues. <laughs> <laughs> but it still happened. I don't know why, but the original is just one of the most beautiful Buddha statues in the world. And to this day, I don't know why it affects me so much. But a third time, I went to Sarnath on pilgrimage and I told all the uh, travelers with me that I'm looking forward to going into the museum at Sarnath outside of Benares and just to do a worship to the most beautiful Buddha statue I'd ever seen, which makes me cry. And I told everybody they were all had their cameras ready waiting to catch me crying. <laughs> And then when I turned the corner and went into the, the, corridor, the gallery, the corridor, I never cried. They were doing renovations. <laughs> and they had this big um, tarpaulin over the Buddha statue as a worker was painting the roof above it. And that was so disappointing, but it taught me an important lesson. You cannot have expectations. And I thought I missed out. And I thought, oh, how terrible that was. But then the worker, who was obviously a local man, he couldn't speak English, I couldn't speak Hindi. He looked at me, and he looked at the tarpaulin, and took off the tarpaulin. <laughs> <laughs> And that was the best, because it taught me you can't expect anything, and the best joys and happiness of life are something you can never predict, and it happens, and how beautiful that is. I know it's something to do with the talk this evening, because it's about something to do with the future, isn't it? <laughs> what is the talk this evening, the title? Antidote to the fear of the future. That's a good antidote, because I, I was afraid I wouldn't see it again. And, but then, just no expectations and gratitude to what you've already had. That sort of overcame all that fear. So I'm very happy to bless these. I'm very happy to sign your books and put funny faces on the first letter of Ajahn. Uh, I do a very good bear A. I did try one um, cat or kitten A. That didn't come out too well, but I did the best I could. Because <laughs> it's nice to have fun, whatever you're doing. And don't really worry how it turns out. Just give it a try and see what happens. That's always been what I've done in life. And sometimes there's fear of the future, antidote to the fear of the future. A lot of time is that positive energy. And I always tell people to live a positive life. Always be positive in all things except one. COVID testing. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be positive there. <laughs> but what you're doing by having that type of mind, we can see fun in anything, is it means that you are developing a very, very good attitude and because you see things in a really good light, you actually create the future with much more happiness, with much more joy. 
in all the years I've been a monk, it's been amazing just how your positive attitudes can create wonderful futures. And I say that so many stories from the past which makes us feel so true. I think you all know that I got in trouble many years ago because I opened the door for giving full ordination to women as bhikkhunis. And of course, you know, I thought, what's going to happen there? That might be difficult. But before we even got to that point, you know, we had to have a place where they could stay. You can't just ordain a bhikkhuni and just leave her sleeping on the streets. That's not right. <coughs> so, we had to find a place. And for me, you can't have it less than what the monks have. It has to be equity. So we looked and we looked and we looked and we looked. Land is very expensive in Australia. Very big, very large, but costs a lot of money. So we started fundraising. You know what happened when we were fundraising? $10 here, $20 there. And you can't buy any land for 10 bucks in Australia. <laughs> But one thing occurred, which I will never ever forget. A gentleman who was Australian, Caucasian, he came, he wanted to see me for something. So he drove up to Bodhinyana Monastery and he got out of his car and he told me that he'd, his wife had just given birth to their first child who happened to be a daughter. He said he was a Buddhist, but I hadn't seen him before. And he said, I hear that you are building a monastery for women, giving them a chance. And I said, yeah. And he said, I, I've just given, or my wife has just given birth to my first child, and she's a girl. I want her to have the chance, if she wants to, she probably doesn't want to, but if she wants to, I want there to be a monastery there for her, to give her that opportunity. I want to make a donation to your fundraising. And what he did next, I'm usually a very calm monk. <laughs> but when he told me how much my hand was shaking, <laughs> honestly, 250,000, a quarter of a million. And that just gave that project such a boost. And where it came from was so beautiful. Just he had his reason for doing that, just given birth, and he could afford it, and he wanted to do something wonderful, just in case his daughter ever wanted to become a Buddhist nun. And I thought that was so sweet and cute. And because of that, I always loved telling that story. And I've never met him again. He disappeared. You know, for years I thought, was that a kind of heavenly being? <laughs> I did think that because heavenly beings do do stuff like that. Sometimes weird stuff happens. If you're a good person, sometimes these heavenly beings come to the rescue. I did tell this story when I was in Kuala Lumpur, because many people, they know I was a theoretical physicist, which is one of the hardest sciences. I'm not talking about difficult to understand, but just got to be very strict that whatever you do is logical, provable, and is not just a supposition. So, when they were asking me, do you believe in all this weird stuff of Buddhism? I said, no, I don't. I know it's truth. I was speaking as a scientist. I've just seen too much in all those years I've been a Buddhist monk. So far, I've been a monk now over 48 years. That's a long time to be a monk. 
most people, if you are working even as a CEO, when can you retire? After 40 years? 45? 48? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm not allowed to retire. But anyway, I'm enjoying my life, doing whatever service I can. And because 48 years is a long time, I know many of you, especially sitting in this front row over here, seen you so many times before, and it's lovely to see you again. And also, it gives a sense of credibility. That you're not some sort of monk who just comes into Singapore and leaves next week. I do, but I come back again. And because of that, that many of these stories you know are true. I don't make them up. So on this occasion, I was a young monk and I was walking uh, along in the mountains of, of northeast Thailand in a set of mountains called Pupan. And at that time, in 1978 or something, there was hardly any development there. Just a few villages, the road was just a dirt road, no electricity. And as I was walking, it was lovely and quiet and lots of solitude. And even, just to keep you awake, even ghosts, real ghosts. Because I stayed in one of the monasteries on that journey. And I was walking to the town of Sakonakon. It was about 60 kilometers to the north. And there was only tiny villages on the way, if you managed to find them. But I asked the head monk in this monastery, are there any caves uh, on this journey? And he looked at me and he said, yes, there are. There's a very well-known cave. Many of my monks, he said, have gone and stayed in that cave and gone mad. There's a very dangerous ghost in there. And I said, I'd like to see it. Are you sure? He said, yeah. And so, he told me where it was. And it was very conveniently located, halfway on the journey between this monastery, it's, uh, what was it called? Tamsi Gao. Monastery Ajahn Sawat was a monk's name. And it was just halfway on the journey, a convenient place to stop overnight. So I was walking all day, I found that cave, and once I found that cave, one of the villagers took me to it and explained everything about it. In the cave, in such a remote area, there was a very old Buddha statue. Not like this one, ancient Buddha statue. People had used that place to meditate, or as monks, to just pass the night for so many hundreds of years. A very beautiful Buddha statue. There was a lovely spring outside with very clean, fresh water. I was kind of surprised why the villager who took me there wanted you know, to show me everything very quickly and leave. And that's when he told me that in the back of that cave there was a skeleton. That was the cave where the ghost was. And even the layperson didn't want to stay there. So I quickly had a shower, shower just you know, getting with a little dip of water, throwing it over myself to wash, as you did in those days. Dried myself off, sat down on a little uh, bench inside the cave, and it was pitch black, no electricity, and then waited. I wanted to see that ghost. I was a scientist. As a scientist, you can't be afraid of the truth. You want to actually see it and find out if there really is a ghost there and what do ghosts look like. Why do ghosts only come out at night time? What do they do during the day? <laughs> so anyway, I waited and waited and waited. No ghost came. 
and I was very tired walking all day in the hot sun I got so tired that I thought the ghost is not going to turn up so I lay down remember there was no lights there at all I lay down and as soon as I lay down nowhere near sleep yet as soon as my head touched the folded robe on which it was resting you heard something running towards me. I don't know if that's good visual uh, sound effects, <laughs> but that's the best I could do. And it stopped about a foot in front of me. Now, it was dark. I could not see anything, just here. And I told that ghost, I'm fed up with you. I've been waiting here for hours and now you want to come? Get out. I think I told you this afternoon that human beings do have much more power than ghosts if they want to exert that power. And I did that because I was fed up with the ghost. Yeah. And so I turned over and went to sleep and that was it. Sometimes, if you're not afraid of ghosts, you don't tend to see them as easily. In other words, you're not that interested. But anyway, hearing it was very easy. And that certainly happened. But the reason I tell that story was the next day, when I continued on my journey, it was just so a remote area that I started to get very thirsty. My water bottle had run out early in the day and there was no streams, no wells, no villages. So I really was thinking that, you know, this may be really badly bad for my health. I was dehydrated. But as I was walking along, dehydrated, wondering what to do and when would ever I see the next village, at a ridge of the mountains, in the valley, I saw a village. You could see by the, the corrugated iron roofs of the huts. There was about five or six huts were down there. So I decided to test out a theory as a scientist. The theory started out by an old story of forest monks many years ago and this one monk who's called Ajahn Chorp and Ajahn Chorp during the Second World War had gone to meditate and learn from teachers in Burma. In those days you didn't need visas, you would just walk and no one would ever stop you. But anyway, he was in Burma in one of the monasteries and that was when the Japanese took over Thailand and the English were in charge of Burma. So these were war enemies. And I have heard that the English thought all Thai monks were spies. And so it was very dangerous for this Thai monk to stay in Burma. He was advised to make the long dangerous journey by foot through the mountains back into Thailand. Now I've never crossed that border between Thailand and Burma but I've lived on the edge of that uh, border and I just know how steep those mountain hills are, even the paths. They go up and down, up and down, a very steep angle. And so I could get some feeling for how difficult that walk would have been and how there would be no people to help him. And according to his biography, that he got so dehydrated himself. That, and so um, famished, he hadn't eaten for days because there was no one to feed him. There's no villages, there's nothing there. Just, it was jungle. 
and he remembered what he'd read in some of the suttas that sometimes heavenly beings would help good monks in times of great difficulty and he actually thought that he was a good monk he was only doing this journey because of you know unforeseen circumstances and wars so he made a resolution Ajahn Chorb said if there really are heavenly beings can one come and help him because he was a good monk and he could very easily die and he made that resolution and only a couple of minutes later he turned a bend in the path and saw a man standing by the side of the path and that man was dressed in modern clothes, actually modern Thai clothes. And having lived in those jungles, the people who actually live there, they dress in rags. And to see someone so well dressed in the middle of the jungle was weird enough. And number two, that he was waiting silently with a tiffin can. A tiffin can with these little trays, one, about four of them. One would have rice, one would have some curries and some fruit. And it was how people would take meals when they worked in the fields in central Thailand. And he saw this man with a tiffin can just w waiting there silently. Now, in our forest monks tradition, we never stop to ask anything. So he walked right past that man and it was only when he'd walked maybe half a metre past that the man said, and he could hear him, Nimon Krap. Are there any Thai people here in the audience today? Any Thais? Okay. Well, Nimon Krap is a word of invitation to a monk. We invite you, Venerable Sir. And he stopped. He turned round, this monk opened up the lid of his bowl and this Thai man appearing in the middle of the jungle put some of the most clean, delicious Bangkok food into his bowl. And there's a difference. I know that because in the jungles in the northeast it's just whatever crawls on the ground. Never any rice, usually potato, because that's all they can dig up. And in that time it would have been worse. And it was hot food. The whole thing was just totally impossible. But it was happening. And it could not have been coincidence. No way could anyone know he was coming. They didn't have Google Maps, he didn't have email to say I'll be there tomorrow. There was none of that. This was in 19... 40 or something, 44. So, having filled his, this monk's bowl with delicious food to keep him alive, the monk made a little, um, I'm not calling it a mistake, he bent the rules because he asked this man, where are you from? You're not supposed to say anything to your donors like that. He's supposed to just be quiet and accept it with gratitude, maybe give a blessing, but not ask, where are you from? Because he hadn't seen the village for days. So the man replied, silently. <laughs> <laughs> and that was in Ajahn Chor's biography. I always remembered that. Do you believe that's possible? I never did, but I thought, let's give this a test. <laughs> I was dehydrated. <laughs> I was a good monk. <laughs> I did keep my precepts. I was meditating, living simply, facing ghosts. So I said, okay. If there are heavenly beings, and I want you to find out, please help me. I'm going to walk into that village, and if there are heavenly beings, 
can I please have a Pepsi? <laughs> That's what he used to drink. The water was really dodgy. He didn't know whether it was clean or not, but at least a Pepsi Cola, it, you know, it's always nice and clean. And a bit of caffeine in it and some sugar, keep you going. So anyway, I walked down into that village. And I was a good monk. I kept my eyes, uh, uh, body length in front of me, on the ground. I never looked to the left or to the right, never said anything. But I did notice in the corner of my eye, the general store. There was one there, and I knew they would have Pepsi Colas there. <laughs> but I walked right past, and no one stopped me. And of course you think, there's no heavenly beings. <laughs> and then I heard the sound, Nimon Krap! <laughs> the words of invitation. And the reason I had to walk past, because it takes time to take the lid off a Pepsi Cola and put a straw in. <laughs> and this man was running after me with an open bottle of Pepsi Cola to give to me. Do you think, hang on, it gets better. <laughs> that was actually, I'm not exaggerating, that was actually quite amazing, but I was still skeptical. It could have been just a coincidence. But then another woman came running out with another bottle of Pepsi Cola. <laughs> And then another man with a third bottle. And then another with a fourth open bottle. And then a fifth bottle of Pepsi Cola. And then someone came running out with a sixth bottle. And then a seventh bottle. And then an eighth bottle of Pepsi Cola. And then a ninth bottle of Pepsi Cola. I had nine bottles of Pepsi Cola. <laughs> And anybody who knows Thailand, that is a magic number in Thailand, nine. If I'd have done that trick in some remote part of Malaysia, I would have got eight bottles, because eight is a magic number here. <laughs> so I had nine bottles of Pepsi Cola. And I, I, there was a bench there, a very simple place to sit down. I put the nine bottles in front of me, all open. I didn't drink any yet. Wow. Okay, heavenly beings, you've won. I now have confidence in you. Yes, you do exist. And I drank a little bit from each bottle. There's no way you can drink nine bottles of Pepsi Cola, <laughs> even if you're thirsty, and gave the rest to, to some kids who were playing around in that village. And that really taught me a wonderful lesson. I made that resolution, if there are, please give me a Pepsi. And they gave me nine to make sure I never doubted their existence again. <laughs> and that's been, yeah, okay, go on. <laughs> and that has been sometimes a story of my life. Very often, you know, you, you know, I'm senior monk, leading monk, and you know, you, you start some of these projects, and you, know, you sort of give support to the Buddhist fellowship, getting a new center, you really want to encourage them as much as possible, not just the Buddhist fellowship, I get myself involved in so many other people's projects. Sometimes they look at me, I don't know why they do this as a main fundraiser. I don't have any funds. But I have this great confidence and faith in the heavenly beings. When there's something which is beautiful, needs to be done, they always seem to come and help. As with this story, I, I'm going off on a tangent as usual. <laughs> so I don't, I sometimes say, you didn't talk about how to deal with the future, but it is sort of how to deal with the future. If it's something good you are doing, you never need to doubt. Pang Hong, you know, you're taking responsibility for getting a new center. And of course, you know I'm right behind you. 
it's a good thing to do. If you fail and go to jail, I, I'll be in the next cell next to you. Because <laughs> I know how these things work. When we decided to get some land for the nuns in Perth, people were you know, uh, driving me around looking for suitable blocks of land and then we went up to one part of Perth to this small 30 acre bit of farmland. I don't know why they took me up there because it was hopeless. Basically, I don't matter how much funds we have in the bank or don't have, I'm not going to allow it to be spent on this, this small uh, plot of land which is not inspiring, which is not going to help anybody. But on the way, there was a big advertisement for 560 something acres of beautiful solitude. And I thought, that sounds good. And the man driving the car said, I oh, forget about it, Ajahn Brahm, that will cost a fortune. We can't raise that. And on the way back, I said, it doesn't cost anything to look. <laughs> so he went and looked. And my goodness, it was a beautiful block of land. It had the water, the solitude, the mountains, so close to Perth, but secluded. If you want to know how much 563 acres are, it's two kilometers long by 1.1 kilometer wide. It's about the size of the Catholics Vatican city-state. I've got big plans for that place. <laughs> but anyhow, that we can't afford it. But then we found it was on auction. And on auctions, you never know how much it's going to go for. So let's give it a try. And because I was fully behind it, our committee decided to, yeah, let's give it a try. If we don't have enough money, it doesn't matter. So we counted people pledged, see how much we can borrow, how much we can somehow squeeze from another account for the time being. And we came up with the amount, this was stretching it, 600,000 Aussie dollars. That would be really, really tough for us to repay some of the, the loans we'd have to get. But 600,000 was our limit. So what do I do next? What I did next was to go with another monk one hour before the auction started, get onto that land and do some really powerful, super duper, <laughs> really incredibly deep chanting. <laughs> we chanted and chanted and ch I don't think that's illegal, <laughs> but we did it. And even though you're a bit hoarse after an hour's really tough chanting, we decided to see if it would work. And our monks don't have much excitement in life. <laughs> but that was exciting. There was a nun's monastery on the line here. Were we going to get it or not? And oh, that was just really tough. So when we started bidding, that's when I had to be quiet. We had one of our members would be the bidder. I think many of you know him, Eddie Fernando. He was a Singaporean before he migrated to Perth. Good old Eddie. Because we said, you can bid up to 600,000, no more. And when the bidding started, 400, 425, 450, do I hear 475, 475 over there, 500, 525, 550. <laughs> Even I started to get excited. <laughs> and Eddie put his hand up, 600,000. That was our limit. And I started my chanting again. <laughs> Oh, 
please, heavenly beings, keep everybody's mouth closed. <laughs> it's a bit unfair, isn't it? Someone said 625. Oh, no. I thought, so close, but so far. But never mind, that's life. This is when you have to let go. Where you realize you tried your best, it's not meant to be. And I did let go. And then Eddie put his hand up again. 650! <laughs> <laughs> and the treasurer was standing next to me. We can't afford this. <laughs> Stop him, Ajahn Brahm. <laughs> Disown him. He's not ours. Take away his membership of the BSWA. <laughs> And I think, you know, my response, I said, no. Somehow or other, you know, we'll, we'll manage. So the treasurer almost resigned on the spot. <laughs> and it was passed in at 6.50. We got it. <laughs> we didn't know how we were going to pay for it. <laughs> we did get it. And then when I told the people of Nolamara, he said, we could only afford 600,000, but we managed to buy it for 650. <laughs> they did exactly what you did. They gave a standing ovation. They really wanted it. And it's because people wanted it, they could see its beauty and how wonderful it would be. Of course, the extra 50,000 came very easily, simply because you were working on inspiration. And that inspiration is something which is you, a, a fundraiser. That's how you work it. If it's something which is beautiful, the Buddhist fellowship, getting a place for the first time, you'd be amazed at what happens. So you don't need to worry about the future. Worry that the present moment, you're a good person, you know, keeping precepts, being kind, being selfless, being generous. If you're looking at the quality of your life and how good you are and what you're actually doing, it's not that hard at all to raise funds for something as worthy as a home for the Buddhist fellowship. And this is one of the reasons why that I've co collected so many amazing stories which are true. I do make up jokes, but I will let you know when it's a joke and when it's true. And one of those really uh, goosebump eliciting stories was when there was a young American monk, man he was in the Peace Corps in Thailand for two or three years. And after finishing in the Peace Corps, he decided he wanted to become a monk, to try it out. But he didn't know how to do it. So he was staying in a hotel on the outskirts of Bangkok, and he asked the concierge, how do I become a monk? Now the concierge was used to telling Americans how to do other things in Bangkok. But becoming a monk was not what he was used to. So he did say, there is a monastery in Bangkok called Wat, Wat Bawan. I know that monastery. I've been there many times to stay. They offer accommodation. It's pretty central and comfortable, very rich monastery. And sometimes there are Westerners stay there. So he said, go to Wat Bawan. Go early in the morning with a tiffin can full of food. Offer it to one of the senior monks on arms round and ask him, can I become a monk? That's how it's done. So he didn't give perfect instructions because this American when they're so early in the morning, everything was locked up. And there's hardly anybody around that time of the morning. And so he was walking up and down, all the doors and gates were locked, not knowing what to do. 
And as he was walking, not knowing what to do or when the monks are going to come out, a Thai man came up to him and asked him what he was doing in perfect English. And the, the American said, well, I, I want to be a monk and this is what I was told to do. I've obviously got it wrong. And the Thai man said to him, you've come too early. But doesn't matter, I have the keys, I can let you inside. And he opened, he had these keys and opened uh, this iron gate. And having opened the door, took this monk, this monk to be, this American, into the main Upositor Hall, where people get ordained. He turned on the electric lights in this hall, opened the main doors of the hall, and took this American inside and showed him all these paintings which were on that wall. And this was 150, 200 years ago these were painted. And if you've ever seen those traditional Thai artwork, you will notice that these are stories which are you know, either from the time of the Buddha or their art, uh, uh, Jataka tales or something, but they're like a cartoon but most cartoons which you know, we'd read in newspapers in Singapore, you know, they start from the left and they go to the right, and then there's another line. These go all over the place. And if you don't recognize the story, you can actually, can't actually see, you can't see the cause and effect, what comes first, what comes afterwards. But this Thai man knew these stories perfectly. And it was so fascinating to listen to even the stories of who offered these and why. In those days when they were painted, people would die of things like typhoid or obviously malaria as well. And he said, this one over here was offered by the family of a young boy who got typhoid in the jungle. And they did this as an act of merit making for him. And this Thai man knew so much and after he'd taken him to the last painting in this uh, Upositor Hall, this ordination hall where they do the main ceremonies, then he said, it's almost time now, so you go out of the gate, I will turn the lights off and lock up. And if you go to that middle gate there, in about five minutes there will be an old monk who will come out. He's the one who you should ask, I want to be a monk. And that's what he did. And this old monk came out and said to this young man, wait here, I'm going on arms round. When I come back, I'll take you inside. And, and that's what happened. And that's how he started his training to be a Buddhist monk. But to be a Buddhist monk, some of you may have done temporary ordinations. But to be a Buddhist monk, there's a lot of things to learn. Not just the chanting, for the basic rules of the Vinaya, what to do, how to wear your robes, where to put them, all this other stuff. It's a lot to learn. So he had a monk who was his mentor. And after a few days, this American complained. He could not understand the accent of the mentor. The mentor's English was not that good. So he said, can I have another monk? And the other monk said, this is the best we've got. This fellow is the best English speaker in the whole monastery. And that is when this American said, what about that temple attendant who met me that first day? What temple attendant? The one who let me in that gate. You can't go through that gate. Even I know that much. I know that temple. That gate, a wrought iron gate, is only allowed for royalty. That's when the kings, the queens, the, the uh, 
crown princes, only when they go through that gate can you know, other senior monks go through there. And he said, no one's got that key. Only the abbot, not a temple attendant. And when he started saying all these impossible things, they said, you better come to the abbot right now. And he went to the abbot, and the abbot started listening to him and stopped him. And said, hold on. This has to be recorded because this is something very, very weird. Again, no one knew all those stories of those murals, not even the old abbot. He didn't know. And he was the most senior, eldest monk in the whole place. So they took down his statement, and that is now in the annals of what uh, Bawani waits royal temple and at the end of taking down all of this information the abbot who later became the head monk in Thailand Somdet Jnana Sangwara I used to call him Jnana Sangwon he asked him what did his Thai man look like because he basically doesn't exist we don't let um, these keys go with temple attendants. No one can open those doors. Even where he was supposed to turn the electricity on, you can't. The whole thing was weird. And he spoke with such a good accent, English accent, yeah. What did he look like? And this American said something, you know, totally inappropriate. Well, how do I know? You ties all look the same. <laughs> You know what people say. But he was trying to be helpful, and that's when this uh, American man was scratching his head, like people do. And then he stopped scratching his head. The American man froze. And in great surprise, pointed to a painting on the wall of the Albert's office. It was him. That's the man. It was him. It was a portrait of one of the main sponsors of Wapawadi Wait Temple, King Rama the Fourth, who died over a hundred years ago, more than that. <laughs> now, you may say that how do I know that? And because it's these stories which go around, but I knew that American monk. But also, many years ago when I came to Singapore, I was invited to give a talk at the Thai Embassy. And when I gave a talk at the Thai Embassy, the ambassador was listening. And after I told that story, the ambassador put his hand up, stood up, and said, I just would like to let you know, Ajahn Brahm and everybody else, that story is 100% true because I am on the committee who looks after Wat Bawan, you know, the lay committee. And I've read that report. It's in our, our, like our history books, of the history of Wat Bawan. It was true. A Thai king now reborn in another realm, heavenly being, came down to help an American man become a monk. That's weird. Supernatural, yes, but true. Told to you by a theoretical physicist. <laughs> and I love stories like that. <coughs> It shows there's more to this world than actually people think. And, am I out of time yet? Five minutes, okay. So the last weird, I'm on to weird stories now. The last of these weird stories is more personal. This was about 
Yeah, about 19 years ago, our Buddhist society in Western Australia were going to celebrate our 30th anniversary since formation. And Ajahn Jaka, the former abbot, had left already, so I was in charge. And our president at that time <coughs> was a young man called Sol, Sol Hanna. I just, <coughs> sorry. I get excited telling these stories because <laughs> I know that they're true and they've got beautiful endings. Uh, our president was a guy called Sol Hanna and he was the youngest president we've ever had in our Buddhist society in Western Australia. When they asked me, are you sure he's a good president? Shouldn't we get someone more experienced? And I said, no. He's, got, he's been a monk before, a short time, and he's got lots of ideas. And if anybody know anything about the BSWA, we were pioneers in podcasting. And it was this guy, Sol, who was at the forefront of making sure that all the talks which someone like me or Najan Bamadi later on gave were all put online and podcasts were made available for everybody. He told me that he was on not the leading edge of IT, the bleeding edge, because we wasted a lot of money, but it was worth it. Because we didn't really know what was going to work, but the money is there, use it. You know where I learned that? I learned that from you, Singaporeans and Malaysians, who told me it's the uncles and aunties who have the funds, it's the young people who have the ideas. So your job is to actually to create the funding and give these young people these wonderful ways of spending it, which will waste a lot of money, but we create new avenues for spreading the Dhamma. And so, he was even interviewed once by the BBC in London, because he realized our BSWA in Perth was a leader in podcasting and getting it together. So he was our president. And together, Sol and I, when we knew it was going to be 30th anniversary of the Buddhist Society of Western Australia. You've heard me say this even this afternoon, whatever you do, give it everything you've got, don't hold back. And that's what we did. We wanted to show that Buddhism has arrived in Australia. And so everything, everything was working out so well. We had a, a block of um, government land called Supreme Court Gardens in the center of Perth, which was used to hold big events. Our anniversary was on Waysac in May, a Sunday, a perfect timing. People would have time off. It was a full moon. It was May. The weather should be okay. So we hired it, and it was available, which shocked me. We invited people, all the important people we could, to come for this event. Money wasn't an object. I shouldn't say this, but I'm a monk. I don't have to do without. But no, we were going to do a very big show. We'd invited the... Thai ambassador, we invited big shots like the premier of that time of Western Australia was a gentleman called Jeff Gallup. And Jeff Gallup, he went to Oxford where he was the best friend of Tony Blair, who happened at that time to be the Prime Minister in UK. It was Jeff Gallup was Tony Blair and Cherry Blair's best man at their wedding. They were that close. 
and I started fantasizing at the time. If we managed to get Jeff Gallup as a Buddhist, Tony Blair would be easy. <laughs> and then we'd get Mr. Bush, because Tony Blair was very sort of friendly with Mr. Bush. And then we'd have the whole Western world as Buddhists. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it didn't quite work like that. But nevertheless, what happened next, we really made a lot of effort into making this a very good event. We got a big new Buddha statue, golden one from Thailand. No, gold plated, not real gold. But then, when I woke up that morning and went outside, it was raining. The rain's okay, it passes. But then when we checked, there was a weather event, a serious weather event predicted by the Bureau of Meteorology, which was headed straight for Perth and would hit the center of Perth at 7 p.m. when we were to start our ceremony the worst possible storm at the worst possible time. And it was raining all day. It never stopped all day. But nevertheless, everybody was working so hard, even in the rain. We managed to erect all the tents, all the electricity, everything. And because we'd invited the Premier of Western Australia, his office called three times. Are you cancelling? And three times I said, no. One of our members was a merchant seaman. And he remember him taking me aside, Ajahn Brahm, look, you're embarrassing us. I know whether you know, I was a seaman, the, whatever it's called, the um, barometer is going down and down and down. There is a severe storm on the way. You have to cancel. And I said, no. I think you may know me as a very, very stubborn monk. <laughs> I think you know me as I admit it. No, and then even one of the monks, he came up to me, he held me by the shoulder, pulled me aside. Ajahn Brahm, please cancel. You're being stupid. Look at the weather. He can't hold any event like this. No. <laughs> that morning, I didn't tell the monks this. That morning, before I sort of left my, I think the cave was there at the time, before I left my cave, I did some, again, really heavy chanting. Because <laughs> this, I, I did, this was, this was Vesak Day. It's the 30th anniversary of the founding of the Buddhist Society of Western Australia. It was important for the spread of Buddhism that we could actually do this. You have to help us. And I did that chanting really repeatedly. So I had a kind of confidence it would work. But then what happened? I was in the VIP tent making final arrangements for the chairs and the tables and stuff. And then this woman, this, she was Burmese, she came running into the tent crying. And I thought, oh no, what's happened now? And someone got electrocuted. Because <laughs> when there's lots of water around and you know, cables everywhere, someone could trip and they could electrocute themselves or break a leg or something. But she wouldn't say. She said, come outside now. And I went outside, and she just pointed up into the sky. And you could see the full moon for the first time that day. It was nighttime now, about 6 p.m. 
and the clouds had parted. Where the rain had gone, I don't know, but around our venue there was clear sky and a beautiful wayside full moon above the site. <laughs> that was miraculous. And so we held our ceremony. The Premier came, the Thai Ambassador came, all of the VIPs came. We held that ceremony and after the ceremony was fi finished, the skies opened up and poured and poured and poured with rain. And that field was under two inches of water that night. The freeway was flooded. It was a major weather event, but it stopped for us. The Premier now became a friend. <laughs> <laughs> and he is the sponsor of our Jana Grove Retreat Center. And one of the, the, the head, the CEO of the company who hired out the chairs, the tents, the tables, the stage, the electricity, who hired everything to us, sent an email to one of the organizers and said, we've never heard who this Ajahn Brahm is, but can you please ask him personally from me who is going to win the horse racing today? <laughs> <laughs> and I take that as a compliment. I should have cancelled. I was asked if we could cancel. But of course, you don't fear the future if it's such a beautiful, inspiring and wonderful future of showing that Buddhism is just more than just uh, meeting together and having lectures and ceremonies. And it's amazing just what we're up to. And there's many beings, even in Australia, who want to help if it's a very good thing. And so there'll be many heavenly beings in Singapore too who are waiting for the chance to have a new beautiful Buddhist fellowship building. I don't know if that's enough for now. Okay. Can we say three sadhus to Ajahn Brahm? Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. <laughs> Ajahn, uh, may I start with the questions, yes, please? Sure, sure. Um, there's one question here. Hello, Ajahn Brahm. I've been Hi. trying to meditate for some time. Uh, I'll stand there so you don't have to twist okay. your head. <laughs> Okay. I've been trying to meditate for some time now, but have not had much success. My main issue is that I cannot stop my mind from talking. I guess that's because I live alone and my company is... Oh, my only company is my mind. So we both need to do talking, I think. I must admit my mind does the most talking. I often have to pull it back. Uh, and it goes off with my imagination, I think. I don't think I know what silence is. Can you describe it and tell how I can achieve it? Another point I've heard you speak about meditation is for the mind not to seek overstimulation but to go in. What does going in mean? Thank you, Ajahn. Okay, I'll answer the first part of the question to begin with. You want me to describe silence, so I'm now going to describe it for you. That's why silence is so easy. You're resting, you're at peace. Many years ago when we were raising funds for our nuns monastery, that one of the fundraisers in a, a very uh, wealthy, a very kind uh, Malaysian Buddhist's house, that she said, she had a 10,000 Australian dollar check ready 
for the Bhikkhuni Monastery on one condition, and that was that I, Ajahn Brahm, would sing a song. <laughs> now that's not proper for a monk to sing a song, so it put me in a difficult position. If I sang a song, I would break my Vinaya rule. If I did not sing a song, the Dhammasara Nansa Monastery would go short of $10,000. But never mind, monks can be very sneaky. So I said, I will sing a song if I can choose the song. He said, yeah, as long as it's a well-known song. He said, yeah, it's an old Simon and Garfunkel song. He said, okay. And she handed over the 10,000. And I said, it's Simon and Garfunkel's first successful single called The Sound of Silence. <laughs> <laughs> and I was quiet for about 10 minutes. Okay, that's Ajahn Brahm's version of the sound of silence. <laughs> and she, she said, I can't out, outwit an Ajahn Brahm. So she, she coughed up the 10,000. <laughs> but um, silence, many times people are silent, but you don't notice it. It's one of the reasons years ago a Kongmen son was doing a one hour quick meditation class for executives. I did this. I started saying, now please listen to me. And as I'm talking, you will begin to notice many spaces between my words. In those gaps, what was going on in your mind? And most of them got it. They were silent. They never noticed it in their lives. Once I pointed it out, now they could see silence. Another good exercise. You're in this room now. What do you see in this room? Do you see the people in this room? Do you see the, the chairs, the stage, the ceilings, the walls? Can you see the space between all the people here? The space between the walls, between the ceiling and the floor? which is much greater in volume than all the things in this room. But as human beings, we've been trained to see things, not what is between those things. We've been trained to see ideas, thoughts, not what is between the thoughts. And after a while, when you start to see what's between your thoughts, you start to be able to notice silence much more than you thought existed. And then after a while, you will also discover the silence is much more interesting, restful, joyful, blissful than the thoughts. One of the stories which I always admire, and I repeat maybe too often, but I think it's a great story, was of Lao Tzu, probably pronounced that wrong. And he would go on a walk with one of his disciples every evening, as long as their disciples kept quiet. They weren't allowed to speak. And then one day, on one of those walks, a new disciple was, was with the master, they came to a ridge in the mountains when there was a beautiful sunset. And the disciple forgot the rule 
and said to his master, look what a beautiful sunset that is. He broke on the rule. And so the master turned around without saying anything, went back to his monastery. When he got back to the monastery, he said, that young student broke the rule. He can't go on a walk with me ever again for life. They thought, that's a bit strict. Anyway, what's wrong? You see a beautiful sunset. Why can't you say that's a beautiful sunset? And that's when Lao Tzu replied. When he said, what a beautiful sunset, he was not watching the sunset anymore. He was just watching the words. He wasn't watching the sunset, he was watching the words. And that's the trouble with thoughts. Now our idea of the world is just a bunch of thoughts. We never really understand the world. We just know that our thoughts about them or other people's thoughts about them. We don't see it for ourselves. Next time, whoever asks that question, I'm spending a lot of time on it because it's a great question. The next time you see a sunset, try being silent, not saying anything about it, not giving a commentary. You'll be able to enjoy it much more in silence than when you try and paint a picture of it. Give that a try, and then you know what silence is. Okay. Dear Ajahn Brahm, I don't like my job, but feels like quitting, and feels like quitting, but this job pays me well, and I need this money, what should I do? <laughs> If you really enjoyed your job, please don't tell your boss. Because your salary is like a bribe to make you do something you'd rather not do. <laughs> so, to enjoy your job, see if you can look upon your job in a different way, to see the benefits and beauty in it. And by seeing the beauty and benefits in that job, this is like looking at that wall with the two bad bricks. You know, that's one of the books you've got on sale, I did have on sale today, two bad bricks. That is just how overcritical we can be. I built that first wall, I made two terrible mistakes, and because of that, I was embarrassed and ashamed of that wall. I didn't enjoy it at all. I wanted to destroy it. Just like you and your job, you can see two or three bad things, and you want to destroy that job. You say, I don't enjoy it. I didn't enjoy looking at that wall. Until somebody told me it was a beautiful wall. How can you say that? I built it. There's two crooked bricks in it. And then they said, yes, I can see the two crooked bricks, but I can also see the 998 perfect bricks in there. And that hit me like a brick. <laughs> For the first time, I could see the 998 beautiful bricks in the wall. I couldn't see them before. Every time I thought of that wall, I thought of my mistakes. Every time I went past and looked at it, I saw my, and my eyes went to my mistakes. And that's why people can be so critical. They see their jobs and they see the mistakes in those jobs, the negative part. But in your job, <coughs> if you can change the way you look at it, you'll soon be able to see 998 beautiful things in that job. And you can also add beautiful things to that job. That's one of the last times I came here to Singapore that we did a little seminar on work and especially on CEOs. There's one, just was, he just got out for the toilet, that's why I can mention this. And I think it was he who said, 
you all expect your job to make you happy. How many of you go to work of a morning and say that you resolve to make another person happy that day? That you actually go out to make a person happy rather than expecting the people in your work to make you happy? And I was about to put my hand up and he stopped me. He said, yeah, except for you, Ajahn Brahm. Don't, I know you're a monk, that's your job to make people happy, to tell stupid jokes and stuff. But he said, apart from you, how many of you go to work and you say, I'm going to make one person happy today? And if you can do that, you create a much more beautiful environment in the office in which you work, or the place you work. And that would mean that your life in that office would be far, far better. You would teach, encourage other people. You're making other people happy. And then they, they know how great that is, they try and make you happy as well. <coughs> and then work becomes much more pleasant. And as people know in today's world, I know this, that work is not about an individual person who can work really hard, who's very smart. It's all about groups and teams. And if you have a team, a group, who can bond and you help each other, then you can have a wonderful success at work. You get by with less effort, with more success, and more joy having a team you're working for. People in an office, it should be like a football team. Many people, imagine in a football team, if the center forward and the right winger, whatever they have these days, imagine if they tackled each other. You tackle people from the other team, not your own team. And that means that you can have a much more successful life at work. Thank you, Ajahn. Dear Ajahn, if what is done is finished, is this an irresponsible attitude, especially when duties are not completed? Duties are not completed. Duties are never completed. <laughs> Be honest. So, what I was inspired by was a monk called Ajahn Buddhadasa. He came up with some wonderful sayings. And one of the sayings he came up with was arised because he was building a new hall in his monastery. It came to the first day of the rainy season retreat. It's a retreat. So he sent all the builders home. Come back in another three months. So after he sent the builders home for some peace and quiet, then people would come and visit and they'd see this half-finished hall, would ask him, when are you going to finish the hall? And he said, what are you talking about? It is finished. And that shocked them. Are you going to leave it like this, without a roof on, with no glass in the windows, with rubbish and cement bags all over the floor? And he said to this man, Sir, what's done is finished. And then he went into his heart to meditate. That's the only way you can find any time in today's busy world. To say, what's done is finished. And I do recall one of the first times I mentioned that in a Friday night talk. On Sunday morning, these couple of Sri Lankan parents came to see me to complain. I love complaints sometimes, they're funny. <laughs> I said, you remember that saying you gave last night, or Friday night, that what's done is finished, that's the only way you can have any rest. Well, my 17-year-old son he was supposed to finish his work, his assignments and homework before I'd allow him to go out on a Saturday night with his girlfriend. So I asked him, son, is your homework finished? And he quoted you, Ajabrab. 
He said, as Ajahn Brahm said, what's done is finished, Dad. I'll see you on Sunday. <laughs> and I thought that was really cute. Son eventually finished the homework, but not sort of before he went out. So, in life, can you ever finish anything? Of course you can't. I've been building Bodhinyana Monastery for the last 38 years. Is it finished? No. Exactly. What's done is finished. Have I finished answering this question yet? No. No. But what's done is finished. I'm shutting up. <laughs> is that another lots, question? Yeah, there are lots more. Okay, yeah, see, what's done is finished. I can never finish them. We can, for how, how long we, however long we've got time for, you can ask another one if you wish. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ajahn. <laughs> how do we stop being angry? Easy. Be silent. You know that if somebody really tries to make you angry, that's a wonderful invitation not to get angry. If you get angry, that really makes your enemies happy. And sometimes I think, why am I going to make my enemies happy? They're trying to make me miserable, so maybe I should make them miserable by not getting angry. So if somebody really tries to upset you, don't give them the luxury of seeing you angry. Seeing if you can be peaceful and calm. And that really upsets them, no end. <laughs> I shouldn't really say that, should I? And instead, there's a saying which now is very popular. You can see it on people's t-shirts in Australia. It <laughs> and the, it's a bit coarse. But this is what Australians are like. <laughs> says, no need to get angry at your enemies. Oh. Karma will get the bastards anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ajahn. <laughs> I often fall asleep during meditation. Can Ajahn share any tips on how to overcome that? Yes, get the partner to have a little taser gun, electric pot <laughs> they use for sheep or cows. And when you start to get sleepy, <laughs> if you start to get sleepy during meditation, it's not a big deal. Let yourself be sleepy, don't fight it. And after a while, it will disappear by itself. If you try and fight it because you're ashamed of it, you take it personally, then when it does disappear, you'll have restlessness. And you'll calm down the restlessness, and then you'll have sloth and torpor again. Always like a pendulum going between sloth and torpor and restlessness. The way to overcome that is stay with the sloth and torpor, don't fight it, and just be aware of it as best you can. And you find when you don't want anything, you're happy just to be a bit sloth slothful and torporful. Torpid or something. Torpedoed? Is that the right word? I don't know. <laughs> when you're nice and peaceful with the sloth and torpor, you'll find it's not being fed and it soon disappears. What is sloth and torpor? A lack of energy. And you try and get rid of that lack of energy by wasting more energy. Don't do that. Stay with the sloth and torpor. Waste no energy at all. And the natural energy flow of your mind will go in there and the sloth and torpor will disappear and you'll have peace. Not restlessness, but peace. And honestly, I've done that so many times, so many years. That is the best way to overcome sloth and torpor. Thank you, Ajahn. Ajahn, what is that powerful chant you mentioned? <laughs> 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 
<laughs> it is the indescribable chance. <laughs> no, there's so many chants which it's not so much what the chant is, but where the chant comes from. If you're a monk or a nun who's done lots and lots of deep meditation, then you can feel the power inside of you and you can really understand what that chant means. And you can then sort of make it so powerful, you are actually asking the heavenly beings help. And it's for a good cause. If you want to chant those heavenly beings, look, there's a beautiful girl in my office I really like. Can you please make her like me? The heavenly beings would not be interested at all. <laughs> if you are thinking of asking the heavenly beings, can I please have a winning lottery number? They won't be interested in you. Although, I did tell this story in Kuala Lumpur, because people asked about the power of dreams. You know, sometimes dreams can be predictive of the future. Sometimes they can be. Like this man in Perth, he had the dream of the five angels, five heavenly beings. And it was one of these very lucid dreams, which you usually get before you wake up. And each of these heavenly beings had five big pots of gold, worth a fortune. And one by one, they presented him each with five pots of gold. And when he'd received the 25th pot of gold, that was when he woke up. He looked in his room, in his bedroom, he could see no angels, he didn't mind that, but there was no pots of gold either, that was disappointing. But when he put on some clothes, and went down for breakfast. His wife had already gone to work, but his wife had cooked him a breakfast of five boiled eggs <laughs> and five pieces of toast. What is with this number five? And he looked at the morning newspaper, fifth day of the fifth month, the fifth of May. And he looked in the back of the newspaper, the sports section. In Perth is a race course named after a famous course in UK called Ascot. A-S-C-O-T. Five letters. Could this be an omen? He turned the newspaper to the, the horse racing in Ascot. And you can imagine, you almost had a heart attack when he saw in race number five that day, horse number five was called Five Angels. <laughs> that horse was running that day. Fifth horse, fifth race in Ascot, five letters. So he thought, you only get one of these chances, maybe once in your life, if at all. So he decided to take the afternoon off work. He went to his bank and drew, to keep the lucky number five, drew out 5,000 Australian dollars. He went to bookmaker number five on the race course. He dreamt this, it couldn't be wrong. He put $5,000 to win on horse number five, race number five, five angels. This dream could not be wrong. It wasn't wrong. His horse came in fifth. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.
That's the trouble with dreams. They're very accurate, but we don't know how to interpret them. Thank you, Ajahn. Uh, dear Ajahn, currently my husband and I keep thinking about the uncertainties of life. For instance, death. It makes us fearful to decide whether to have a child or not. We are afraid if one of us leave first, what will happen to the ones that will be left? What should we do? First of all, death is not an uncertainty. <laughs> But why worry? If you do worry about death, it increases the probability that you will die. The anxiety is a terrible disease which weakens you. It's just like sometimes that you see people, husbands and wives, they love each other, they're very good people. But sometimes one of them is so afraid that the other one would leave them or would die. They make their own life and their partner's life a misery. They say, don't go out. No, don't go in an aircraft, it might blow up. Don't do anything because they're afraid. I, I don't want to lose you. When you worry, that increases the chance of calamity happening. You should all know that. And anyway, if you know the husband or wife have a kid and one of them dies, is that really such a tragedy? I know this one young man, his father died tragically when he was only 16. And this young man turned out okay. <laughs> That was me. I lost my father when he was, I was only 16. It was a really important time of a young man's life to have your father there to guide you through those difficult years you know, of finding a career, finding a path. But by that time he'd already taught me so much that he, I was empowered enough to look after myself and make good decisions in life. And so, it was like your parent was still there with all the lovely memories. He was the one who told me about opening the door of your heart. <sighs> it's one of the best teachings I've ever gotten. And that was from my dad, who was very poor. What he also did once, I was only 11 years of age when I got a place in the school football team, primary school. I was actually good at soccer. I eventually gave it up because people said it's much better to do homework and become a scholar. We didn't realize that football players, if they were good, could make such a lot of money. You only need to work a couple of years and then you can totally retire. <laughs> So anyhow, I gave up. But this was my first time playing football at, you know, at a representative level, it's only for the primary school. It was so important to me. I told my dad, I've got a place in the school football team. We're playing our first match on Saturday morning. And he said, oh, that's just a great shame. He had to work on Saturday mornings. And I was actually quite disappointed. I never showed him that how disappointed I was. Your son, first time, and he really needs you there. So anyway, I went to the football match, and we started playing, the kickoff had happened, and I was running around. I was playing right wing, and as I was playing around, suddenly, I heard somebody shout my name, come on, Peter, that's my lay name. And I turned around, it was my dad. He was at the football match. I couldn't believe it. And afterwards, you know, after the match was finished, I said, I thought you were supposed to be at work. And he said, yes, I am supposed to be at work. <laughs> he said, I lied to my boss. He said, 
I told him I need a series of injections every Saturday morning. <laughs> and I did that, I risked my job so I could come and see my son play football. And of course, it's not good to lie. You can't praise him for that. But I still love him for doing that. He sacrificed so much just to see his little son play a football match. And I'll always remember him for that. That was so sweet. He taught me so much. And if ever I put my health on the line or other things on the line to come to Singapore to teach, that's where I get that example from. If you need it, of course I'll come. It's a beautiful thing. I don't know if she's, oh, this is one of the uh, long time Buddhist fellowship members. And I was told that her husband died. I was told on a Friday uh, morning, her husband has died here in Singapore and she would love it if I could get to her funeral on Saturday morning. I said, how can I do that? You know, I'm supposed to give a talk on Friday night in Perth and do all these other arrangements, engagements in Perth. I can't just suddenly just drop everything and come. So I did. I dropped everything, gave the Friday night talk. I managed to book a flight on Singapore Airlines, the overnight flight which arrives at, at least about one o'clock in the morning, gets here about six or seven, I forget which. And immediately went to her house to give her some um, counseling and to be there for the funeral service for her husband. And after that was finished, I think on, I forget, Sunday morning or Saturday afternoon, fly back to Perth. And she was amazed I could do such a thing. I said, yeah, sure, why not? You help me, I'm gonna help you. Sometimes you do those crazy things. And I'm often told by the people in Perth, Ajahn Brahm, you're pushing the envelope. Which means, you know, you're just stretching it a little bit too far. Sometimes you really get into trouble for doing this. And I always remember my father, that's what he taught me. He put his job on the line because his son needed him. And sometimes I can do that for you. If it's at all possible. It can be bad for my health. It can be working too hard. But no, it's, it's a joyful thing to do. Okay. Thank you, Ajahn Brahm. And um, to let everybody know, Ajahn Brahm, after a nine-day retreat and a long flight, went to see one of our most loyal BF members in hospital. So we are very grateful, very compassionate, Ajahn Brahm. Uh, Ajahn, uh, it's late, so can we just give a last question, please? Yes, okay, yeah. So it's a combination of a few. A few of the members have, uh, quite a number, have asked about rebirth. What happens when we die? And how do we transfer merits to people uh, who have passed on? Thank you, Ajahn Brahm. Okay. What happens when you die? You do have this thing which we call the mind. It's separate from the brain. That is one of the reasons why um, in Renchi Hospital, I think it was, no, was it? It could have been Renchi Hospital. We had a, um, a little conference about what happens when you die. And I've seen myself, it's happened, that when a person gets very close to death, they may have dementia, and they kind of recognize everybody around. The dementia disappears the last hour or two of their life. I've seen people who've been in a coma for such a long time, and they start to open their eyes and speak to people again. And apparently I was told there's a word for that now in medicine, it's called terminal lucidity. Just before you die, your mind is clear and you can remember people whose name you haven't known for years. You can actually just remember details. When I gave this story once over in Perth, a doctor who attends our Buddhist society said, yes, one of those things happened to him recently. One of his patients who was dying of cancer 
the, the dying process started earlier than he expected. So he rushed to the patient's bedside, and at the bedside, the patient had started dying. It was only a couple of hours before the death would be finished. And so he opened the drawer next to the patient's bed, pulled out the address book, and rang as many relatives as he could. Your dad is dying. Your husband is dying. Please come to the hospital as soon as possible. And one of the people he rang up was a man's daughter. Do still, 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 still remember her name, Julie. And this is your dad's doctor, Julie. Your dad is dying. Please come as soon as you can. And at that point, the man opened his eyes and said, please tell Julie how much I love her. And that was the last words he spoke. He died no, a second or two afterwards. And so, to me, that's a beautiful concept, terminal lucidity. Your brain is shot, it's gone but your mind just takes over just for a few very important things which you have to do. So when you die, please don't worry about taking things like morphine. I say that as a Buddhist practitioner, people think I need to be aware when I die. You will be, even if you're in a coma, because what happens is your brain is what stops you knowing at that time, but after your brain is transcended by this thing we call the mind, then you will be clear. So, and when a person does die, often they hang around for a little while to make sure everything is done well. That's one of the reasons why monks do chanting for them, or nuns do chanting, to make sure they're well and happy as they can be, please for you to give them permission to die. Them holding on for you is a very cruel thing to ask them to do. So look, they're about to die, go with my blessing. Just like you may have a son or a daughter who's going over to UK or something to, you know, to live with their new partner, their new family, go with our blessing. That's what a mother or father, anyone who loves, should be doing want you to be happy and you give to the people you love you don't expect back and then when the person who dies goes off they have the near-death experiences out-of-the-body experiences and number one everybody who's experienced what death is like is so much more peaceful happy than being in your body it's like you are free from this body which is in pain, which is, feels very heavy and burdensome. Now you're floating out of your body, as one person said, like without a care in the world, peaceful, free, happy. And then you have to make sure that your mind is well trained, so you don't worry or get anxious. Keep peaceful, especially if you're a Buddhist, just recall all those beautiful teachings you've had from the monks and nuns of how to let things go. Let it be. If you see that light, people always say you go towards the light. That is exactly the same as the nimittas which you see in deep meditation. So when you practice this nimitta meditation, you are actually in one sense preparing how to die and one day it will be of great use to you. And also you'll find out that you know, if there is still unfinished business, then you'll come back again and have another life. You don't have to worry too much about people who die prematurely. You come back and can start all over again and you know, meet some of the people you've known before and come and get reborn in a nice Buddhist land like Singapore. But this time, please have a job which you don't have to work so hard for. <laughs> and that's what happens. It's not a, a worry at all. In fact, that when a person dies, it is like a time of freedom. Sharing merits is 
some of that sharing of merits is not for the person who's passed away, it's for the family to give them something to do and to be able to express their love. Look, even though I've got no intention of passing away, you won't let me, I know that. But nevertheless, it's nice to be able to give to a monk. Many people have given me so many things, medicines and cakes and food, which I cannot eat. But even though I will not make use of these things, I will still accept them. Because it's not that I need them, but you need to give them to me. And then I will pass them on. It's not that some of your relations need to have their stores of merit increased, but you need to give it to them. And so that's why we do the sharing of merits, because you need to do it. If the people who have died can receive them, that's a double bonus. It's mostly for the people who are alive. I'm being honest with you. Sharing the merits is a beautiful act to do, to remember the people who have passed away. Sometimes people ask me, have you shared merits with your teacher Ajahn Chah? And I say that's like giving a donation to Elon Musk. <laughs> He's got so much money, he wouldn't even notice it. <laughs> That some people have got so much merit or the beyond merit then it's a waste of time sending anything to them but they will not receive it but it's sometimes nice for you to give it that's all okay so there is another question asked is there another last question or is it just one last question that was the last question thank you Ajahn Brahm can we say three sadhus sadhu, sadhu. 